Hello everyone, Black Color here, and today we are going to be doing the second part of the Legend of Sleepy Hollow lecture. If you didn't see the first part, I will be covering a bit of that in here, so you can feel free to watch that if you choose. Just a little recap, Ichabod Crane is a very superstitious man. He pines for Katrina, and so does Brom Bones. Brom Bones plays on Ichabod's superstition in order to mock him through pranks. And then, at the end of the last lecture, there was an event announced to take place at the Von Tassels. General plot going from that point on to the end ichabod and bones go to that event um, at the minier uh, von tassels um, minier being a dutch flemish surname meaning sir uh, here meaning madam uh, in the last one i said that it was just an alternate spelling to manor that is not true uh, i looked it up afterwards um, crane dances with katrina and then a bunch of ghost stories start being shared uh, as well as stories about the American Revolution. Bones joins in with his encounters with the Headless Horseman, and then we have Ichabod supposedly getting rejected by Katrina, and then he leaves. He's full of paranoia, and he spots what he thinks is the Headless Horseman. After a chase to the church, Crane is struck down and goes missing. Bones then marries Katrina, and Crane is either to have led a new life elsewhere, or he has been spirited away by supernatural means. Uh, according to the old uh, country wives. Now, covering the characters that were introduced, uh, we have Hans Van Ripper, who was an old Dutch farmer. He was the one who lent the uh, horse to Crane, the horse's name being Gunpowder, uh, a well-worn horse, compared to Daredevil, uh, which is Brom's horse, um, Brom Bones's horse, uh, and that horse is a lot like its owner. Uh, described as being full of metal and mischief, supposedly faster than the Headless Horseman. Uh, St. Vitus is very briefly mentioned when comparing to Crane's dance moves when he's dancing with Katrina. Uh, historically, he was a Christian martyr, one of the 14 holy helpers uh, in Catholicism in the Middle Ages, around 303. Um, in Germany, people would celebrate his feast with a dance before his statue. This dance popularized and is called the St. Vitus Dance which is now used to describe the neurological disorder of Sydenham's chorea. Sydenham's chorea is characterized by rapid, involuntary movement, a neurological disorder in childhood from the infection of the group A beta hemolytic uh, streptococcus, which is the bacterium that causes rheumatic fever. Uh, moving on to some more characters, we have the Sager folks. They're the ones who begin telling the stories about the American Revolution. After the end of the dance, and they're each described as dressing up his own tale with a little becoming fiction. Uh, we have Dofu Martling. He was mentioned in one of the stories. He is a large blue-bearded Dutchman. I have the definition of a bluebeard, which is a word used to describe a man who marries and kills one wife after another. So needless to say, not a very likable character. But he's supposed to be the one in the story that we're supposed to think is the hero. Uh, he was described as having almost taken a whole British frigate by himself with just an old nine, old iron nine-pounder from a mud breastwork. Mud breastwork just being a uh, trench, essentially. And an old iron nine-pounder is a uh, gun that's pretty fictitious when talking about stories during the Age of Sail uh, for heroes that are used. Um, and then we have the old nameless gentleman who was another uh, man from a story. He was described as deflecting a bullet with his sword in the Battle of White Plains, which was a British victory. Um, so needless to say, they're probably a little uh, sour about that, but they made up their own stories anyway to um, make their side uh, full of heroes. Moving on with some more characters. This one's a little more important. We have Major John Andre. Uh, historically, he was a British Army major and a British spy, but he was also the head of the American Secret Service. After he was discovered for being a spy, he was hanged. Uh, he was discovered when he was working against Benedict Arnold in the Continental Army. And in the story, he was supposedly hung on, hanged on a gallows nearby. We have Old Brower, who... At first, I thought was a historical character, but as it turns out, it's just going to be another Dutch Flemish surname, meaning beer brewer. He is described as a heretical disbeliever in ghosts, and uh, according to the locals, he was a victim of the Headless Horseman. Uh, needless to say, they're 
the locals are probably trying to mock people who don't believe in ghosts with this story, which I think is pretty important moving forward. And then last but not least, we have the old farmer, which is a character often discounted whenever there are retellings of this story. He was the one who claims that Crane is still alive and simply just left town to lead a new life. Now, uh, I just alluded to it, but there are two endings according to the characters. Either Ichabod left town to lead a new life, uh, where he served in the Ten Pound Court after studying law. I defined Ten Pound Court in the previous video, but in case you didn't see that, uh, Ten Pound Court is simply just describing uh, justices of the peace who were able to hold a trial in uh, trials involving a sum of less than ten pounds. They were able to hold it without a jury. Um, or the alternative was that Ichabod was spirited away by supernatural means. Uh, that is the story told by the old country wives. Now, media has portrayed the story in so many retellings that people have become confused as to what really happened, but The Legend of Sleepy Hollow was not intended by Irving as a mystery, as we'll see here. So what really happened and most likely conclusion that we can draw from the story is the account from the old farmer who comes in claiming that Ichabod is still alive. Now, just reading what that account was, Ichabod Crane was still alive, that he had left the neighborhood partly through fear of the goblin in Hans Van River, and partly in mortification at having been dismissed by the Harris, that he had changed his quarters to a distant part of the country, had kept school and studied law at the same time, had been admitted to the bar, turned politician, electioneered, written for the newspapers, and finally had been made a justice of the Ten Pound Court. That's said on the very last page uh, from the book that I'm using to read this. Um, the other account, Irving seems to be mocking. Uh, he poses this alternative ending, and then he uses a lot of sarcasm in order to mock how silly it sounds. Um, so just reading what that account was, the old country wives, however, who are the best judges of these matters, that's an example of Irving using sarcasm. Pretty obvious here, um, giving more credibility to an old wives' tale than uh, an eyewitness account. Uh, but these old country wives maintain to this day that Ichabod was spirited away by su supernatural means, and it is a favorite story often told about the neighborhood around the winter evening fire. Now, if you remember from the biography, if you saw that video, Irving was a very satirical author. Uh, he wrote for the Salma Gundy, which is a uh, magazine that he helped start. Um, it was a satirical magazine. Uh, you can think of it like Mad Magazine today. Um, and then, if you recall from the beginning, right after talking about the Headless Horseman and the Headless Horseman's background in the very beginning, uh, Irving immediately states in the next paragraph, such is the general purport of this legendary superstition, which has furnished materials for many a wild story in that region of shadows. He also mentions this after all the superstition that follows the area of Terrytown and Sleepy Hollow. And notice a similar wording here, favorite story often told, and then uh, furnished many a wild story towards uh, this description right here from the beginning, and then the one at the end. Now, you may be thinking, well, then what about Ichabod's encounter? What actually happened? Uh, and then I have this important excerpt right here. Um, then, as he wended his way to the farmhouse where he happened to be quartered, every sound of nature at that witching hour fluttered his excited imagination. And how often was he thrown into complete dismay by some rushing blast howling among the trees and the idea that it was the galloping Hessian on one of his nightly scourings. Now, if you didn't know from the page numbers that I put here, you would probably... Um, suspect that this was towards the end, right before his encounter, and there's a lot of mirroring, but in this case, this is just going to be an example of foreshadowing in the background of Crane's paranoia whenever he travels at night. And then we're going to get into the mirroring now. I just want to remind uh, from the beginning, uh, we have Ichabod became the object of whimsical persecution to bones. Keep that in mind uh, moving forward. But mirroring is used in the beginning where superstition is mocked and then satirized, and then towards the end it seems to come to life. And people take this at face value and they don't 
really take into account the sarcasm that Irving is using, which is why a lot of people think that the ghost story canonically actually became true after Crane's encounter. I just want to point this out right here. Crane was a perfect master of Cotton Mather's history of New England witchcraft. It was often his delight to con over um, old Mather's direful tales until the gathering dusk of the evening made the printed page a mere mist before his eyes. This is mentioned right before talking about his paranoia when traveling at night. And then, later on, uh, at the end of the event when the stories are being told, um, all these tales sank deep in the mind of Ichabod. He repaid them in kind with large extracts from his invaluable author, Cotton Mather, and added many marvelous events from his own experience. This is mentioned right before he travels at night and comes up with his encounter with the supposed headless horseman. Um, and then I have this quotation right here, Ichabod's fear increased with the delay. We'll see what that's referring to in the next one. So more mirroring. We have every sound of nature at that witching hour flooded his excited imagination. That was towards the beginning. And then at the uh, towards the end, when he actually encounters the Headless Horseman, um, it was the very witching time of the night. Witching hour, witching time. That Ichabod pursued his travel homewards. At this moment, a plashy tramp by the side of the bridge caught the sensitive ear of Ichabod. Sensitive ear, every sound of nature. Uh, more comparison can be drawn there. Then... He beheld something huge, misshapen, black and towering, like some gigantic monster, ready to spring on the traveler. Uh, like some gigantic monster, his excited imagination. More parallelism there, and the uh, part with the sensitive ear and every sound, because it's mentioned twice, that is most likely why he has such big ears in this caricature of his from the cartoon uh, retelling of the story. Now, in this case, we're going to discuss the one behind it all. In this case, it is going to be Brom Bones. He is the one behind the encounter. Now, let's use some mirroring in order to discuss the similarities between the horseman and Brom Bones. So, from the beginning, when we are first introduced to Brom Bones, from his Herculean frame and great powers of limb, he had received the nickname of Brom Bones, by which he is universally known. His favorite steed, Daredevil, was a creature like himself. Uh, um, both in appearance as well as in character. And then we go to the description of the supposed headless horseman. He appeared to be a horseman of large dimensions and mounted on a black horse of powerful frame. Notice the similar wording here. We have Herculean frame when talking about brawn bones, and then we have powerful frame when referring to his horse, which we know is a lot like himself. Um, also, just a horseman of large dimensions. We know Brom Bones is a very skilled horseman, and we also know that he is large. He's burly. Um, so the description of a horseman of large dimensions can be used to describe both Brom Bones and the supposed headless horseman. We also know that Brom Bones likes to play pranks on Ichabod, playing on his superstition in order to mock him. I have this excerpt here I shared in the last one. Bones and his gang harried his hitherto peaceful domains, so that the poor schoolmaster began to think that all the witches in the country held their meeting there. Brom took all opportunities of turning Crane into ridicule in the presence of his mistress. Notice he took all opportunities of turning Crane into ridicule, and Crane immediately jumps to witchcraft in response to all these pranks, which is not what we would consider the logical conclusion to jump to. Crane already well knew at this point that Bones was trying to court Katrina, and he was his competition. Bones is known for his pranks. Uh, he's a notorious prankster. He likes to um, harass a lot of people, but never in a mean-spirited way. Um, so when, you know, the chairs in his schoolhouse were all topsy-turvy, 
it was it should have been the first conclusion he jumped to instead of witchcraft but because he's very superstitious that's his conclusion now what was bones's motive to do this well it's going to be uh, gaining the affection of Katrina, not through mocking Crane, uh, but simply getting rid of the competition so that there is no obstacle in trying to pursue Katrina, because all the other gentlemen who tried to pursue Katrina would give up as soon as they saw Bones, but Crane did not. He was his one real competition, and so Bones was trying to get rid of him. Now I have this uh, important excerpt right here when Irving is talking about um, his views on women and uh, gaining their affections. He who keeps undisputed sway over the heart of a coquette, which in this case is going to be Katrina, a flirtatious female, is indeed a hero. Certain it is, this was not the case with Katrina and the redoubtable Brom Bones. And from the moment Ichabod Crane made his advances, a deadly feud arose between them. Um, and then we have this uh, somewhat mirroring excerpt right here at the actual event. Uh, the Lady of Crane's Heart was his partner in the dance. This is going to be Katrina partnering with Crane for the dances. And smiling graciously in reply to all his amorous oglings. While Brom Bones, sorely smitten with love and jealousy, sat brooding by himself in the corner. I have this quick little definition of brooding here, showing deep unhappiness of thought appearing darkly menacing. This is a word we would often see used to describe an antagonist of a story. And this dance was probably the nail in the coffin for Bones wanting to pull this prank on Ichabod if it weren't as premeditated as uh, some believe. Now, there are uh, arguments against this conclusion that it was Brom Bones, but mostly because people want to validify the ghost story aspect of this, uh, and we're just going to deconstruct that real quick. So, first question, how did he appear without a head? We already know Bones is a prankster, he plays on Crane's superstition, and also the poor visibility at night. Crane is described as having... Uh, multiple times throughout the story, not being able to see as well at night, and I think this is very important to cover. Uh, even when he does finally see the Headless Horseman, it's uh, briefly, and when there's a gap in the trees and the moonlight is shining on him, um, and considering the fact that Crane is already superstitious of a Headless Horseman, just pulling off this obviously gross exaggeration would probably be enough to trick Crane into thinking that the horsemen were actually headless, not to mention the large dimensions of this horseman. Now, if you were to wear a costume like this, you are obviously going to seem to have larger dimensions anyway. So, pulling off this headless look at night with Crane's superstition in mind could have been very comically easy. Um, now, this gross exaggeration, I am certain that Brom Bones would have been riding Daredevil and not this fake horse. Um, being able to catch up with Crane on foot would be an impressive feat, although I wouldn't hold it against Irving to portray Brom Bones being able to do that uh, with all the uh, strength and powers of limb. Uh, moving on to the next question, more importantly, we have, why would Bones scare Crane out of town? Crane already got rejected by Katrina, and he would no longer pose his competition. This is probably the best argument against the conclusion that Brom Bones had something to do with it. But, in response to that, I would say, Bones would not have seen this rejection or know about it. So, when Crane left uh, the event, without looking to the right or left to notice the scene, Crane went straight to the stable after his supposed rejection. Um, so he didn't look right or left, he didn't notice what was going on, he didn't even know if Bones were still there, um, because he wasn't looking, he wasn't paying attention. He just went straight to the stable and left. Um, probably very disheartened from the rejection. And even the author is unsure of what actually happened uh, during the assumed 
rejection. He says, what passed at this interview between Crane and Katrina, I will not pretend to say, for in fact, I do not know. Now, it is very unlikely that Brom Bones would be holding on to this information that not even the narrator would know about, considering the narrator is semi-omniscient in this story, uh, knowing pretty much everything, all the details and background, um, but not this one particular event. And I think this is very important to cover. Irving does this very intentionally. Um, and even if Bones did magically know that Cranes did get rejected, even though the narrator doesn't know, well, even if he did know, maybe he would have already set up the prank and he wanted to fall through with it to ensure that Crane wouldn't try again because Crane is a very persistent fellow. So even if he knew Crane got rejected this one time, uh, he may try again. So he wanted to ensure that wouldn't happen by scaring him out of town. Uh, and then we have this right here. How would Bones have gotten there in time if he didn't know Crane left? How would he have gotten in front of Crane if he left after Crane did? And how would he know where Crane would go? I'd like to point out once again, Bones is a very skilled writer. Foremost at all races is how he's described. So even with just his sheer speed, it would have been pretty easy for him to catch up with Crane, who was probably traveling at a very slow pace, um very disheartened, discouraged when traveling back to the farmhouse where he was uh, staying at the time. And he could have even used an alternate route to catch up with Crane if he needed to. There is an alternate route alluded to at the very end. The bridge became more than ever an object of superstitious awe, and that may be the reason why the road has been altered of late years, so as to approach the church by the border of the mill pond. So, this alternate route is alluded to, and Bones could have easily just taken an alternate route to catch up with Crane if he actually needed to catch up with Crane. And Crane, as I mentioned earlier, did not see Bones on the way out. He just beelined straight for the stable, so he wouldn't have known if Bones were still there. So Bones could have just left early to set up the prank. He was already brooding by himself, sitting in the corner. So it's not uh, too unreasonable to say that he could have just left early. Now, before Crane left the event during the ghost storytelling, and this is response to that last question, how would he know where Crane would go? So when they are telling all these ghost stories, American Revolution stories, Bones brought up his encounter with the Headless Horseman and portrayed that by going to the church bridge, the Hessian bolted and vanished in a flash of fire. And then we know that all these stories sank deep into the mind of Ichabod. So, considering the fact that he's very superstitious, very gullible, the second he actually encounters the Headless Horseman himself, he wants to recreate what just happened. He wants to mimic what Bones did in order to get away from the Headless Horseman. So, Bones set up where he wanted Crane to go, and then executed it, chasing Crane exactly where he knew Crane would go. Um... Yeah, I have right here, Crane would take uh, that route to try to do the same to get rid of the Headless Horseman. And this could even be seen as Bones challenging Crane to a horse race for Katrina, and he played on Crane's weakness in order to win. Moving on, we have this last question right here. What if Irving is writing off the story as fake because he is biased and or cynical? Some would consider this the best argument. I would say it's probably the worst um, because you're trying to make an argument about the legitimacy of a satirical ghost story. This does address uh, potential bias by the narrator, but ultimately this is Irving's story to tell. Um, as he wrote it, it is clearly written that the clear conclusion by what the author actually wrote was that the Headless Horseman was just a mere plot device used to illustrate superstition in Terrytown with this uh, Dutch folklore. To argue the story is real and that Crane was whisked away would be taking the story of the Headless Horseman and not the story of the legend of Sleepy Hollow. There are two parts to this. The story about the Headless Horseman, uh, which is just, you know, 
some guy lost his head in the American Revolution, and he whips around at night trying to find it. And then you have the story of the legend of Sleepy Hollow, which is about a superstitious womanizer, Ichabod Crane, um, supposedly encountering what he thinks is the Headless Horseman, and then leaving town out of fear. Um, and then we have examples of taking the ghost story aspect and adapting it. We have the Sleepy Hollow movies, the cartoon, live action. Uh, we also have the TV series and tons of artwork and so on. Um, but like I said, there are two aspects to this, the story of the Headless Horseman and the actual story of the Legend of Sleepy Hollow, over which Irving has full creative control. Um, and then I have this obvious exaggeration, a silly illustration to the right, um, talking about, you know, what people are doing. They're taking one aspect and then something that is not canon, and then mashing the two together in order to make a more interesting story. Um, now, I think it's very important to talk about Bones after the supposed encounter between Crane and the Headless Horseman. Brom Bones, who shortly after his rival's disappearance, conducted the blooming Katrina in triumph to the altar, was observed to look exceedingly knowing whenever the story of Ichabod was related, and would always burst into a hearty laugh at the mention of the pumpkin, which, according to the story, had been thrown at Crane's head at the end of the chase, which led some to suspect that he knew more about the matter than he chose to tell. Rewording the first part, Brom Bones conducted Katrina in marriage after his rival's disappearance uh, in triumph um, by wording his marriage uh, to Katrina as a triumph for Bones. Uh, the author is insinuating that Bones was involved with this encounter and getting rid of Crane. Now, other characters also believe in this story that Bones was involved, as Bones is described as very knowledgeable about Crane's story twice in the same sentence, exceedingly knowing, and he knew more about the matter than he chose to tell. Um... And otherwise, he wouldn't really know about the whole story. I mean, he may have been suspected to still be at the event. Maybe he went home. Maybe he went to hang out with his Rough Riders. The fact that he knew so much about the story and he would burst into laughter after a supposed assault on Crane from a pumpkin, that really illustrates the fact that he was most likely involved with the story according to what the author is saying and it makes sense that bones would be involved he is a prankster probably pulled a prank on crane crane got scared out of town so that bones could get katrina so what is the conclusion we can draw from all the works from irving well from the legend of sleepy hollow we can conclude that crane and bones fought for katrina and bones came out on top by playing on crane's weakness of superstition Irving is mocking how superstitious people can be based on the places that they live, based on the time that he lived in Terrytown when he was growing up. Uh, he doesn't insult these people directly, um, but his works of Rip Van Winkle, which I covered in a previous video, and The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, uh, those two works will be the only ones I'm covering by Irving. Uh, these are both commentaries on the downfalls of laziness and gullibility, respectively. Rip Van Winkle was a very lazy person, uninvolved, uninterested, and Ichabod Crane was very superstitious, very gullible, and he fell for uh, Bones' trap and lost out on getting the affections of Katrina, which, you know, I wouldn't say is a bad thing for Crane, considering, you know, the fact that he is indeed a womanizer, he only wanted to marry her for her estate. Um, yeah, that's all I'll be covering from Irving. Uh, the assignment that I have for next time, if you want to uh, continue following along with these lectures, is reading uh, the following poem from Anne Bradstreet and taking notes if necessary. So the four poems, To My Dear and Living Husband, the author to her book, Upon a Fit of Sickness, and Verses Upon the Burning of Our House, the last one being based on when her house was, in fact, actually burned down, uh, losing all of her possessions in the process. 
uh, and the first one, that is not a typo, it is living, not loving, although my computer would like to try and correct me otherwise. And then I have this interesting optional creative writing assignment. If you'd like to try it out, I think it's a fun prompt to try. Writing an alternative ending to The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, starting from where Crane got rejected. What would you want to happen? Would it be an ongoing story? Would you make the encounter a real one? validifying the ghost story aspect of the story. Um, you can feel free to change the point of view when telling your ending, maybe from Crane's point of view, maybe from Brom Bones, maybe even Katrina, or... Uh, what's his name? Balt Van Tassel, the father of Katrina. Uh, and then I said right here, maybe Irving was just being unfair to Crane, you know, making fun of him for being all superstitious. But either way, the last quotation I have from Washington Irving uh, for my lectures from his works, Love is never lost, if not reciprocated. It will flow back and soften and purify the heart. And I have this uh, great picture of Terrytown. Terrytown and Sleepy Hollow are real places in New York. Um, but either way, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next lecture. Bye-bye.